right, good morning, everybody. <laughs> We're going to get started. We have two presenters today. First is uh, Dr. Lee Chung. He's a second year neurology resident who's been on the neuro ophthalmology service with us for the past month. He's going to pre be presenting a case of word blindness. And then, second up, will be our uh, Dr. Jim Bell, uh, who's going to present a case of uh, red eyes and intubated a uveitic curiosity. All right, Lee. Thank you guys for having me. Um, today I wanted to present a, a case uh, of a symptom I've actually had myself before. Uh, specifically, I'll you know write something down and then look back at it later and I have no idea what I wrote. I can't read it at all. Um, so actually we had a patient who complained of the same problem. Um, he basically you know came in and said, I can't read anymore. You know his exam was completely normal and his visual fields were fine. Um, so, you know, I had to dig back in the literature to see if that was even possible. So the, the patient in question, so he's a right, he's a 16 year old right handed boy, was previously healthy. Uh, one day he wakes up with um, this bright white light in both his eyes, he can't see through it, and he's got this pounding headache, it's a migraine headache. Um, his vision gets back to normal, but he's just left with this headache, you know, day after day, new onset of like a daily chronic headache. He gets a brief workup initially. Uh, which is normal. And then about four months later, he starts having this, this problem where he can't read. Um, he can write, he can understand people, he can speak normally, he just cannot read written words. He can't even recognize the letters one by one. Um, and otherwise, you know, he's totally normal, his you know, mental status is normal. Um, and it gets so bad that he has to have all of his schoolwork transcribed into audio so that he can hear the instructions for his tests. Um, his exam, I won't belabor, but is completely normal. Um, he had formal visual fields done, which were normal. Um, he had a neurologic exam, which again, just showed alexia, or you know, inability to, to read any written words. He couldn't even recognize letters. Um, everything else was normal. His higher cortical functioning tests were completely normal. So the big question was, you know, is this even possible? Could you even have a lesion in the brain or, you know, something that could just take out your ability to read, but you can still write? Um, so this patient has alexia, which we um, define as a deficit in word reading. Um, usually there, there's a preservation of letter reading, so you can still recognize each individual letter, but if it's severe, then early on, you, you might not even be able to do that. Um, it's not caused by a field <coughs> cut and it's acquired as opposed to the dyslexia that we often encounter in like developmental uh, abnormalities with kids. And so in trying to think about Alexia, you know, it's probably first described by uh, Carl Wernicke in the 1870s. Um, as you know, with Wernicke's aphasia, there's, you know, pretty severe language deficit. Um, you know, you can't speak normally, you can't understand anyone, you can't read, you can't write. So it's pretty, it's a pretty global problem. Um, and alexia is just one of the many features of that. Um, and of course, there's uh, th that's caused by lesion in Wernicke's area, which controls kind of language understanding. And then subsequently, uh, in the 1890s, Desjardins was a French neurologist. He described a patient who had only lost the ability to read and write. Um, and he, on autopsy, had a lesion just behind the Wernicke's area the angular gyrus, so it starts to piece together how our language is, is, um, is formulated. And then the next year, he presented a case um, of a French gentleman who, uh, he was 68, and he started having this right-sided numbness and weakness. And then a week later, he had, uh, you know, he's no longer able to read a single word, all the while writing and speaking very well and distinguishing the objects and people that surrounded him as well as before. Um, he actually presented to an ophthalmologist. He thought this was primarily a visual problem that he just could not read anymore, couldn't see well enough to read. Um, and subsequently on neuro exam, he had a right homonymous hemianopsia um, and was unable to distinguish colors on that side as well. And so this was actually Desjardins' initial drawing. The patient went on to have uh, another stroke. His initial insult was probably caused by stroke. He did another one and passed away. 
And on autopsy, Desjardins was able to identify where his strokes were. And he could tell from his older strokes that he had a lesion not only in um, the left fusiform and lingual gyri, but also in the splenium, which is the rear uh, part of the corpus callosum that connects the two hemispheres. Um, and so he thought that maybe um, there was some interruption in the fibers between the visual um, cortex with the um, left uh, you know, fusiform gyrus where language is processed. And so possibly this patient wasn't able to read because of that disconnection. <coughs> Um, and as you know, the uh, optic radiations pass through that area, and so, um, so he also had this right homonymous hemianopsia. And so this later led to the uh, cerebral disconnection theory. Um, so Geshwin wrote a series of, um, uh, of these uh, disconnection syndromes, and he thought that maybe if you could unplug the visual input in both hemifields from the language areas in the left hemisphere that you could cause this symptom. Um, but again, that you know, usually implies that you're cutting off some of your visual field as well. And so I was looking through the literature for cases where someone could have totally normal visual field exam but still not be able to read. Um, and out of over 100 cases, the vast majority have a visual field cut. <coughs> but there were some cases where the patients um, were you know, had normal visual fields. And specifically, uh, this is a case where um, a gentleman had a stroke uh, in his uh, left parietal occipital cortex, no involvement of the corpus callosum, and had this exact problem. He could not read normal visual fields um, in normal language otherwise. And then these are two, um, two cases uh, of the exact same syndrome. Uh, on the top, you can see uh, in the left lateral fusiform uh, gyrus, you see a uh, post-contrast enhancing lesion. It's pretty large. Uh, and in the lower uh, patient, you see, again, in the left uh, uh, kind of lateral temporal area, you see uh, flare abnormalities. Um, and then there's a, a couple other cases caused by various etiologies, um, including hematomas, uh, subcortical hematomas, and even herpes simplex encephalitis. Um, this has even been seen with epilepsy surgery, where you know postoperatively they will develop this exact syndrome without any visual field involvement because of the um, epilepsy surgery. Um, so this has led to sort of a, a new theory about why this could could happen. Um, uh, in this uh, case series, it was very interesting. They took a series of patients with just pure alexia um, on the left, and then in the middle is a series of patients with pure hemianopia, and they superimposed them and subtracted uh, the areas of their lesions, and they found that there is um, an area which they call the visual word form area, which if you lesion, then patients will not be able to recognize words, but everything else is intact. And so just to return to our patient, we did decide to, um, uh, we did obtain imaging. Um, these are diffusion images, which, is look, which are looking for um, ischemia or infarction, and, you know, they're totally normal. Um, here are coronal T2 uh, images um, showing the left um, fusiform gyrus, which is normal. There's no <coughs> lesion. Uh, and again, uh, T2 flare axial images, again, show no, no abnormalities in the area of interest. And then here is a sagittal T1 just to show that the corpus callosum was not involved as well. So in summary, uh, we were unclear about the diagnosis, but uh, we actually found the patient texting on his phone at the end of the clinic visit. And so, you know, we realized that this was probably, you know, less, uh, structural and more behavioral in, in etiology. Um, and so our recommendations were just, you know, no smartphone privileges until he felt better. Um, but I, I thought this was, an, it was a good case just to kind of go through, um, you know, the possibility of, of this <coughs> as a presenting symptom. Um, and so, you know, most importantly, alexia without agraphia or hemianopsia. Um, it's rare, but it's a described syndrome, so it is possible. Um, and these patients may present first ophthalmology, as that index case from the 1890s did, um, and may be thought to be a visual problem at first. Um, a lesion of the visual word form area can produce this symptom, and that, that's kind of a new, 
a new thought that there's actually a locus for uh, recognition of words and letters. Um, and finally, neuroimaging is, is necessary to, to rule out an organic etiology. So that's it. <laughs>